all sort of huddled in like this, and all of a sudden she went, oh, look at such and such, and hit the bottom of my drink, and I poured no. a whole glass of champagne over my, my new dress. I mean, co communication is everything, isn't yeah. it? So, and I think um, having an awareness of, um, of your communication, so what you say, what you do, how you've turned up to the office. I think, you know, particularly our younger generation uh, with social media, being brave enough to have a go, even if you think you can't do it. Yeah. Welcome. How are you doing? Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you. Very well. Great. Well, well first of all, thanks for your time. It's absolutely my pleasure. And um, thanks for hosting us. And uh, here in, where, where are we exactly? In Borden in Hampshire. Yes, yes, in Hampshire. So, um, yeah, well, this is a Secret of Scale interview. We, uh, we had a bit of a chat earlier. Um, before we start, uh, how are you feeling? Feeling good today? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah on a scale of one to ten, I'd say eleven. Oh, wow. So, there we go. That's, is that because we're here? Or? Yes, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> it's, a, it's a whole new experience. Great. All right. Well, actually, um, before we start, we have a starting tradition. Right. Okay. We like to give you this. A wine? <laughs> that will help loads. Are we yeah. allowed to drink it now? You can if you want, but uh, <laughs> probably best not to, otherwise the... The interview yeah. might start going yeah, downhill might, might from there. Yeah, might get a bit too honest. Yeah, but that's anyway, very that's very generous of you. Thank you very much. No you problem. Need to. That's no, fine. that's Thank that's you. fine. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, again, thanks for your time and having us. Um, you know, I'd like to start off with yeah, just find out a little bit about yourself. You know, you, particularly your background, mm -hmm. your kind of early. Uh, early days, uh, kind of leading into your early career, you know, and yeah, particularly, how did you get into your first role, and yeah, how how is your how does your background contribute to that, and yeah, just tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and yeah, yeah. okay, so going right right back, so um, I grew up not far from here in a place called Hindhead. Okay. And there is nothing there at all. It's a set of traffic lights on the A3, or it was at that time, um, and literally nothing else. So as soon as I could drive, that was it. <laughs> I was, you know, out and about um, mm. trying to do different bits and pieces. And so I wasn't really, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, uh, I wanted to be a paramedic originally. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was what I was really interested in. And um, I'd gone to look at different courses and things that you could do, but there isn't anything. You had to be 21 before mm. they even sort of considered training you. What, why paramedic? Any reason um, for that? I just thought that, yeah, it's sort of, well, it's like being a superhero, isn't it? Mm. You know, you are literally saving, saving people's lives, lives and, yeah, you know, really making a difference in, in those critical moments in, in a way that, you know, means more to anybody than, than anything, really. So I just kind of really felt that mm. that was something that was exciting and um, worthwhile and would make a contribution. Mm. So, yeah, so wanted to be a um, paramedic. Mm. Um, but at sort of 16, 17, to have to wait until you're 21 to do anything it felt like an absolute lifetime. And so I was like, I don't want to wait for that. So I ended up sort of having a few different jobs, Saturday jobs, mm. Sainsbury's, all the sort of normal stuff you sort of do when you're a student. Um, and then... Um, decided to just sort of go and get myself an office job. So I learned a few sort of, at the time, secretarial type skill set. So typing and all of those kind of mm. um, skills. Um, and got myself a job, I think it was in car insurance. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was just, it was just <laughs> randomly. Random, yeah. <laughs> just, you know, you go to see an agency and they're like, oh yeah, we got this job and go, going over to, to do that. Um, which seemed, you know, like not really what I wanted to do, but I was, you know, had a full time job and therefore I must be able to afford to move out and get my own place. <laughs> so with some friends, got um, found some somewhere we could rent and sort of moved out and quickly realised that um, what you get paid in a first job is nowhere near enough no. to pay for living on at home and actually doing anything mm. and running a car or anything else. So and how old were you at this point? I was eighteen. Yeah. Okay. So um, I so I ended up having to have a Saturday and Sunday job and evenings and working during the week. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so to sort of pay for the fact that I was going to have my own house um, rented anyway. House flats, bedsits. Yeah. <laughs> and it was, you know, <laughs> playing it fast and loose with the word house. 
Um, so yeah, decided that, that was what I was going to do and persevered for as long as I could. And but it just, you know, it just didn't work. Try. I had a few different roles, moved around a little bit, sort of doing general sort of admin stuff, um, until I found myself in um, travel insurance, sort okay. of helping in, um, helping with the, the customer service team. Yeah. And I was sort of sitting there, sort of like, you know, helping various different managers and, and other people thinking, I could do that. I don't need to just do the admin side. I could do other mm. bits and pieces. I started to think about, if, you know, I'm not really sure that, you know, this is where I want to be with my career. It's, it's, not, mm. it's not really very challenging. It's not terribly exciting. Um, and my mum and dad were working at this company. GMB Electronics, um, and I'd started that, so I'd known that sort of since I was a kid. So your parents were working here. Yeah. So they, um, well, it was their their company. They'd started it. Okay. Um, so. Um, and and that was you so see you, when you were as a, uh, growing up, mm. they 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 had yeah. this. So they they done place. it. So that's that's a quite interesting story that I can tell you. Yeah, yeah, it's, please. It's not about me, but it's about it's more about my dad. So sure. Yeah, please. He'd been um, working. Uh, uh, I can't remember where it was, but he essentially done an apprenticeship and he'd been working mm. with this guy that had been supporting him through his apprenticeship. Um, my dad's dyslexic, mm. um, although it was undiagnosed at, at yeah. that time and yeah. you know, it wasn't a thing that people talked about. And so he really struggled with some of the more academic sort of elements of it. And so his mentor you know, really helped him and sort of helped him to develop mm. his career. Um, and so then he sort of moved on and was headhunted by another company who, not dissimilar to himself, sort of were a bit of a startup, had a new product, needed it to take into production, but wanted to do some of it in house themselves. So he mm. built up the engineering team and built up all the production team. Mm. And then their customer decided that they weren't um, weren't going to have that contract anymore, and it all got pulled. So I think this is right in the middle of a huge recession that was at the end of the 1970s, early 80s. Yeah. Um, and he'd brought his mentor over with him at that time. So, you know, the guy that he really respected is, and now brought him into a company and they're all going to lose their jobs in the middle of a recession. So it was my dad's job to sort of do the, the horrible deed of having to get rid of all of these people. So he decided that... Um, Actually, maybe it would make sense for him to be made redundant as well and to carry on the project and take on some of the team uh, members without them. I see. So he decided that um, that's you know what he should do that felt like the, the right thing. Um, and so he started GMB and brought his mentor over with him and you know the three of them sort of carried on the project and bumbled through the first sort of And when was that what, what year was that do you know so That roughly? was around 1980. Okay. 1981 that yeah. sort of time. And and your your dad's background was he technical or what was So his, yeah he'd uh, done he'd done electronic engineering okay. um, and been done an apprenticeship so mm. he'd sort of worked through that yeah. process. Um, and yeah he yeah so that that whole sort of family ethos of doing the what feels like the right sometimes more difficult thing is definitely something that's been a culture that's coming through into this into the business here yeah and obviously had an so, effect on you yeah of course so you know that that responsibility for the people that are in your care mm. that um ownership of you know that role and and what's important about it and actually it always comes down to the people so that had been sort of drilled into us since you know yeah. So it's, you know, he used to go go to the factory after school and pay with all the pens so <laughs> move everyone's chairs around. So so that's kind of where it sort of all started. And so I was working in this travel insurance company, yeah. kind of thinking, I'm not really sure this is really what I want to do. And actually maybe working for the family business would be a op- bit of an opportunity. And sort of fate stepped in a little bit. It was sort of odd timing that that was sort of going through my head because quite a lot of my social circle was around um, the people that I was working with and it would have been a little bit awkward to sort of just leave them um, at that time when you know you're you know you're in your early 20s and yeah. you know your friend group is like the most important thing yeah. there, really isn't it so the company had a sort of restructuring around the sort of making everybody redundant we we're all going to be relocated to London um, Th- this was your. W- this was where I was working. Yeah. yeah. So okay. I sort of made the decision to say, okay, well, all right, well, I'm not going to, you know, do that. I'm. It's not for me. Um, I'm going to have my notice in and then um, 
join the family business and see how that okay. kind of works out. Yeah. Um, so just, uh, do, but yeah, before you get into that, then, I mean, those, so those early roles that you mm. mentioned um, at the agency, travel agency, and um, before that, obviously you were, you were young, you yes. know, those, those were your yeah. first roles. Um, what, you know, what were the things that, that you learn, you know, the, 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 maybe the, the less, you know, hard lessons or mistakes yeah. you made. Was, was there any anything that comes to mind? You think, oh, you know, these this happened to me. That yeah, I think probably I I underestimated myself. Ah. I think probably I um, kind of thought that you know I had I'd done all right at school. Um, but I never really can, no one had ever sort of said, oh, you know, you can do this, you can do that. You know, it was always quite, don't want to have too much pressure and, you know, all that sort of thing. And no one, I never really had a mentor that sort of said, no, actually, you could do this, you could do that. So I kind of left school thinking, oh, I can't really do anything. Um, not really got any particular skills. I didn't really try for my GCSEs, passed them, but, you know, I just kind of just assumed that that was more of a fluke than anything else. So I didn't really think that I could do anything particularly amazing or special. So I didn't try, Yeah, you, you see what I mean. You didn't have that initial confidence no. anyway. Or, no, or it never even crossed my mind yeah. to, to try to do anything other than maybe just go and work in an office and do some admin. Mm. So, so I suppose that sort of, um, then being in that environment, then made me sort of question, well, actually, I could do as I say, could do some of these things. So that was, was one bit of an eye-opening sort of experience. I think the other was um, uh, certainly understanding what, you know, what things cost. No grasp, living at home whatsoever um, in terms of what it's like to sort of live and survive in the real world. I think that was a bit of a surprise. Um, and actually what you, and how hard it is to earn money. You know, it's going to take some effort. You don't just get paid lots of money for not doing very much unless you are extremely lucky you've got to sort of you know, graft it and you know if you want what other people don't have you've got to be prepared to do what other people won't do and so what I'd learned through my family was that was grafting you have to if you want something you have to work for it yeah. um, you have to put the effort in and you have to push yourself um, and you have to you know believe in what it is that you're doing really so yeah. I think those were the, the lessons, really. Yeah. Um, and sort of waking up to all of that in order to go, okay, well, actually, I need to make a change. Yeah. Some things, you know, something's got to give. Yeah. So, so it sounds like you, yeah, you, you saw these things and that, uh, did that give you a bit more confidence because you thought, mm -hmm. yeah, I could, I can, I could do that. Yeah. And start, you they yeah. got the, the ball suppose, rolling. Yeah, maybe. there is a, yeah, an element of that. But also, you know, I did only ask my dad. <laughs> so it wasn't, you know, and he did interview me and we did kind of go through that yeah. process. Um, but it was um, sort of also in sort of timing where, you know, things weren't working out for me in my personal relationships um, and money had become a real problem. And so it was sort of coincided with, you know, can I move back home and can I have a job? <laughs> can I, you know, so all of those sort of things. Um, and then I came back and thought, no, I really can't just stay in the family business. That's not really pushing myself. Um, I need to, you know, sort of maybe get myself back on my feet and then sort of go and try and do something different. But actually, because it was a small business, um, I had an opportunity to do things that you wouldn't do in a bigger company. So we didn't have a website. So can I make a website? Yeah, I'll make a website. And can I have a go at sort of doing right. sales? Because we didn't have anyone doing sales. So yeah. all these little things I got to sort of That's try right. and, and have a go at. And I, and, and I suppose with, with the education system and schools and stuff, what they don't tell you about manufacturing is that it actually is really creative. You have to have a really great imagination and create quite be quite creative in order to come up with new products work out methods for manufacturing them and all of that sort of element and actually I found that quite interesting um so I decided to go and do electronic engineering as a oh. day release course okay. so um and I, similar to what your, your dad did yeah right? yeah similar yeah. thing so following in his yeah. his footsteps yeah. Um, and, um, yeah, we found myself to be the only woman on the course. Or <laughs> when girl, was this, roughly? Like, we're, we're this would, uh, I suppose we're talking about two, 2000, 2002, mm. something mm. like that. 
Okay. Around that sort of time. Yeah. So, um, yeah, um, I think the yeah the only other woman that was even in, in part of the course was teaching one of the subjects, and I can't remember what that one was, but um, yeah. So I you're think the it was only, only female yeah. in yeah. a group of of yeah males of, so yeah about havoc, twenty really. twenty twenty five, and you sort of I'd be like. Oh. How did you, you feel when you first went in and well, in that situation? Yeah. How did you cope? I think I wasn't enti- yeah, I wasn't entirely unexpected because it's not always um, yeah, not not a tra- traditionally female choice, but to have no other women, that was a bit more of a surprise. So we kind of thought, okay, well, yeah, we'll stick with it. You know, it's, it's mm. is what it's sort of going to be, and so I found. That I quite enjoyed not only being the only girl, but I quite enjoyed beating them at things, exactly, including yes. pool <laughs> at the pub at lunchtime. Yeah, most more, so, most importantly. Yeah, yes, yeah. absolutely. So in terms of so, I think that sparked quite a competitive <laughs> sort of edge of me, and was probably good training for later on because actually, I found that more often than not, particularly in manufacturing and you know sadly in business as well, you'd often be the only girl in the room, mm. which is not right but you know if if those of us that are first at doing that or early at doing that or give up then it doesn't change it for any of the mm. um people following in our st- footsteps so so yeah it was it was a good education for lots of reasons including um being the odd one out do you think do you think that spurred you on gave you more determination i think so yeah yeah Yeah. because you know it was all of them versus me in in a not you know not aggressive kind of mean sort of way but it you did kind of feel like you know you were holding up the whole of the female side on your own and so their assumption of women in engineering was based on just me and so that felt like a a bit more pressure did you get like you know the sexism you know the kind of these comments uh, yeah kind not, of stuff, not often to my not often to my face but there was a yeah there's a certainly a few sort of bits and pieces that yeah. you kind of go oh, okay come on, did that yeah. affect you or you just like um shake it off it's yeah you i think you have to ignore most of it some yeah. of it a lot of it is um over the years is more unbiased i would yeah. say in terms of people's just assumptions yeah. and some of it can be quite comical <laughs> um, um uh, i was uh, on an exhibition stand sort of um chatting to um quite an older gentleman so i'm gonna judge him in return now. yeah yeah Good. um and so he was he was sort of saying oh you know what do you what do you do i said oh, i'm the md he said um uh, what's that marketing I said, no, I'm the managing director. And he went, what? Has somebody died? I was like, no, no. <laughs> but, you know, um, so, yeah. And there was a, oh, I've got another one, but I can't, yeah, it'll come back to me, yeah, but I sure. can't, yeah. So oh, we'll have to cut that in later. But, yeah, there's certainly been a few things over the years where you sort yeah. of think, yeah. really? Um, I've had a guy come to talk to us about um, insurance um, for, uh, um, you know, various different parts of the business and sat in with me and my sister who runs the business with me and um, RFD who was a female at the time as well who went through all of the the options um, and then at the end of the meeting said um, how do you think the directors will feel about this (laughs) (laughs) really (laughs) so um, yeah yeah yeah, you didn't really do your homework before coming did you so um, yeah so yeah yeah but I think on the flip side as well because all of these things are a a double-edged or double-sided coin aren't they so where you get that sort of um, uh, a bit of unbiased prejudice shall we say yeah the other side is that you're also a bit of a novelty and so you do stand out you a little bit, out. and probably yeah. we get more column inches than we yeah. deserve for what it is that we're doing compared yeah. to others. And so you've got to accept both yeah, sides. Yeah, and turn it to your advantage, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. it's business at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got to yeah. use as many strengths and uh, as yeah. you can, right? Yeah, yeah. Makes sense. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, and I've, you know, I've worked in. Um, Stop. Don't yeah. carry on. I was going to say, I've worked in the manufacturing industry for 20 years, 22 mm. years, something like that. Mm. Um, and on the whole, I've always found everyone to be very respectful yeah. and quite keen to promote women in our industry. So on balance, I would say that the manufacturing industry is a great industry, if, even if you are the odd one out. Yeah. So. 
So tell me a little bit with regards to your you know, mid career. Mm. Um, what um, so w- with regards to to your middle mid career? What what would you say were the the key factors to you progressing and what would you say were the key decisions that you had to make during that period? Okay, so during that time um, I was starting to get out out on the road um, as a sales rep, Mm. going around to see a lot of different businesses and that's quite a nervous, nerve-wracking kind of thing to do if you are new to a career and you know you've only got one year of electronic engineering under my belt and um you know going to see these great big you know enormous successful companies and trying to sell them you know um, contract manufacturing um so it's quite a nerve-wracking sort of time for me but what i found during that time is that the companies that i went to go and see were um, extremely kind and generous, the, the individuals I was talking to, that would take the time to explain what they were doing, um, show me how they did the things that they did and explain to me what the products that they were um, manufacturing were, were, who they were benefiting. Mm-hmm. And so it was a huge learning curve for me. And so every time I went to a, another business, um, I learned more and more and more, and not just about what they did, but the way that businesses run, what biz- good businesses look like, what less good businesses look like, what kind of business um, you know we should start to try and become as as we move forward. Um, so it was, yeah, hugely um, uh, inspirational. Tell me about some of the the key decisions because I, I think sometimes when when you're at that mid-career points I mean a lot of time you're you're making decisions maybe not even conscious about so sometimes you are Mm, and 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 sometimes you have kind of big moments Mm. right they they happen either out of your creation or or just through opportunities right you know Uh, so yeah what, what were the the key points I guess and um can you can you tell me anything about um, that, those situations yeah. that, that you yeah, that I had to myself in. navigate? So, um, so I suppose during that time I started to think about um, maybe a bit more about the business and the future of the business. Yeah. So I could recognise that my dad wouldn't necessarily be able to run the business for another 50 years um, and probably wouldn't want to mm. and probably shouldn't. So I was starting to think about, you know, what my career should should look like. I sort of moved from sort of just assuming that I was going to have a job to actually actually being on a career path now and starting to think about the future of that. Um, and so I started to um, consider whether actually um, I should take on the business in the future and what that might look like. Um, having done all that learning with other organisations and so I th- I recognised that I probably didn't have the skill set I needed to take on a, a business. You know, I knew a bit about what I'd done um, and had grown up with it, but wasn't the, the skill set that was going to need to be required. So I started joining sort of membership organisations and get out and do more networking to sort of understand a little bit more about what it is that I might need to know. And I did a, um, through the Institute of Directors, did a... Um, a leadership course on um, uh, directors, being a, mm. having a directorship. So the, mm. the finance element, the um, the legal side, marketing strategy, um, uh, through that sort of environment, and that was really interesting because um, being a small business, you know, doing a, a course on top of you know the day to day work that you have and the hours that you do required of it anyway trying to do a course with a whole lot of projects was um yeah a bit more than i needed so this was quite a short sort of sweet sort of few days on each sort of module to again give me an understanding of what i might be expecting if um if i decided to take on the business so that was quite interesting and helped me sort of so the decision to do that and then the decision to sort of move on to understand more about what might be involved was key sort of that time so I was on the fence and you know do I want to go and do something else entirely different somewhere else do I want to stay where I am those kind of things were you know will I get an opportunity like this ever again anywhere else would I be a fool to let something like this slip through my fingers so a lot of that was 
kind of going on. Um, and at the same time, you know, working with, you know, the family business as to, you know, what, what kind of direction should that be taking? Where should we be trying to get new clients? What directions should we be going in? Hmm. Um, and we, you know, selected the, the medical um, area was one that we already had some clients in and was definitely one that, um, that I had a passion for. So it sort of linked back into that early um, career aspiration of uh, paramedic. It felt like it was something that, again, had had meaning that we could maybe support um, companies that, you know, are, are doing their bit to, to help sort of mankind and the people that you work with in those kind of industries. Um, are a bit uh, a bit special in a really in a good way. You know, they're they're doing something to to contribute more than themselves. So it's it's yeah. quite a nice industry to be in. So that was quite nice in terms of a decision to do more in that space. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, yeah. Great. And uh, li- listeners uh, are predominantly. Uh, entrepreneurs, business owners, uh, but also people that are mid-career. Uh, what what would be your advice to those that are uh, either yeah mid-career looking to you know get to into management or even into management getting to those those senior positions um, based on on your experience having done, gone through that obviously that that, that process. Um, what would your advice be to those looking to progress, progress their, their career? Yeah. Yeah. So I think you know, be a, be an avid learner. I think you know, any course or um, something that you can do to under- develop your understanding of you know leadership or whatever area you're interested in doing. Every every penny that you can spend on your own um, personal development, there is no better investment than that. Yeah. Um, and if you want to be noticed in the workplace, you know, it is, it's having that next step thinking, doing, going over and above and beyond, being on time, doing at minimum the, the basics of your, of your role um, and shine. Business leaders want to make easy, higher decisions. And if you've got someone in your team that is, you know, outperforming everybody else, that is thinking about, you know, the projects are beyond just what they are, um, what their area of um, responsibility, then you've really got someone that has, you know, um, going to shine. And that's an easy, higher or mm. promotion decision. So, you know, invest that time in yourself to. Not necessarily do loads of hours. I don't mean that, um, but you know, use your use your mind, use your your gifts. You know, do your best work, um, mm. and you know, um, and be, take pride in what it is that you're doing, and others will notice. Yeah, and it will become infections, and all of a sudden, the, the people around you will do the same, and that's how leadership starts. Yeah, what what, what do you think are the the, the kind of traits? Because, I mean, obviously you all have your own personality, of course, and way of doing things. And, I mean, I found that, uh, you know, some people like are rising stars. You know what I mean? Yes. And and it it certainly seems on the outside that it just, it's like natural. It seems so natural for them. It it probably isn't, Mm. you know, but it seems on the outside like that. For me, it was never like that for me. I I struggled a lot Mm -hmm. at that middle. Yes. And and I think a lot of people do. Yeah. How do you get from there to you know to uh, to those those senior positions? And it, it took me a long time to realise that my natural the way that I was naturally. I mean, I, I got to a certain point, but I ha- I had to change. Mm. Actually, I had to change a lot a lot of what I was doing. Um, so you know, kind of with that in mind, what, what what do you think are the traits you know to to be able to to have that responsibility? Yeah. To have that kind of mindset and lead people, and you know, uh, to be able to, whether it be a, a manager or a senior manager or a director, what what do you think are the key traits? Yeah, I think um, having an open mind. Mm. You know, if you can approach every conversation that you have with the mantra of "I may be wrong," and mm. genuinely listen to those around you in terms of what it is they're saying. I mean. That you've, you've already made if you've already made up your mind of what you think you have to assume that everybody else in the room has done the same thing so if you haven't come to the same conclusion then you haven't really understood what everybody else knows 
so you've got to you've got to have an open mind to to really make sure that you ask the right questions because there is no right or wrong answer to en- anything um, mm. you've got to be able to make a decision and you are going to suffer the consequences of that so if you've been able to think about what that first second third consequence is going to be and you've weighed up the risks of each one of those decisions and you've genuinely gone into it with an open mind um, and asked the right questions um, and then more questions and then more questions again then you are demonstrating that you have the ability to understand a problem and not just do the easy thing of jump in with your first reaction and let's just do this and then recognize later on that maybe that wasn't the right thing Mm. what what, because i you know you i think we've all seen or worked and we've seen um people in positions of uh seniority and and yeah, they're they're terrible leaders, right? I mean, you know, you may work with these people, you may see them, obviously, in others. So, but they're there, right? Yeah. Somehow, they, yeah. they they've done that. Now, I mean, why why do you think that happens? You know, because there, there's obviously a certain type mm. uh, of traits or personality that that means that those people are successful. But obviously, um, they're their per- the, per- the perception that people have of them certainly mm. privately might might mm. be negative. Mm. I mean, why why do you think that happens? And and what why why what what are those traits that people should be aware of? Yeah, that that that, 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 could, that could be that could actually you might think that are good. That because yeah. I always think oh you know you got to be like this person. Yes. you know whether that's yeah. like a you know be a bastard or, or you got to yes. be um, you know quite cynical yes. or heartless. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, what are your yeah. kind of thoughts and I on think that? There, I think the different businesses have a different culture. And I yeah. think there are some businesses where that is the exact culture that yeah. everyone considers to be the way. Yeah. Um, and um, what's going to be the future? And, you know, you if you become a manager, you're expected to adopt that yeah. personality. And I think that comes down to sort of sitting with, you know, what's your personal values? What what feels right for you? Where do you, what kind of business do you want to work for? Um, or yeah. or create and then build a team of people that think like you think if you are in the wrong lobster pot so to speak mm. then you've got to do your best to find a, um, an environment that sort of sits well with your own personal values and you know in a piece um, in order to you know have a, a career that you find rewarding I think if you find yourself surrounded by people that are traumatizing to you in a way that you know um that doesn't sit well with with you as how things should be done Mm. you're going to end up with mental health issues yeah you've got to choose the right tribe for you yeah um and i think if you get a a person that is not right for the tribe that they are in again i think that comes down to the leadership team and the business team to to try and tackle that issue and i think that can be done as a group to say you know what behaviors should be should be right here i mean it is leadership isn't anything that's taught in anywhere really particularly it's something that you you become very good at a particular job and you get promoted and you get promoted and the only way for you to get any more money ultimately becomes being responsible for a team yeah um and there's no training for that and all of a sudden you've got this um this responsibility and you know the people that you've seen throughout your career are the ones that you kind of think oh, okay well they used to do it like this so I'll try doing it like that and actually yeah. what we need is better role models yeah so you know going getting online and finding yourself a mentor there's plenty of leadership um, podcasts and YouTube channels and stuff out there to sort of demonstrate what the the new normal and generational people th- that's what we need if you want to your business to survive you've got to attract the next generation yeah and i don't think that they will put up with no. the behavior of some of these right. old school yeah. businesses yeah and, and i think that's changing right mm-hmm. and uh yeah that's that's kind of uh, hopefully what we're 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 highlighting yeah. yeah okay great so yeah so on on advice uh to uh like i was saying to uh, to business owners, entrepreneurs, 
or people looking to get up up the ladder. Uh, do you have any any other advice uh, based on on your yeah. experiences? Yeah. So um, so in terms of next, everyone's sort of next step thinking that that bit sort of you know. It, beyond what it is that you're doing um so and i think a, a lot of people are familiar with that and and that will be something that's fairly standard but if you can think two steps ahead or the first consequence of what you've done the second consequence of what you're doing and the third consequence of what is um of, of what's happening that is really powerful so it's thinking beyond your role beyond um what you've done and what you've experienced and thinking about how it's going to affect other departments, your clients, your client's client. And if you can have that sort of vision and have those type of conversations with your customers, managers, colleagues, they will understand that you are thinking over and above what it is that is really your remit. Um, And anyone that can have that kind of vision of what they're doing is hugely valuable in any business. Mm. So, yeah, first, second and third consequences would definitely be a bit of advice. Great. That's uh, that's very, uh, yeah, very good. uh, um, Thanks for that. So um, let me talk about, you know, of course, when when you're operating as a CEO or as an MD, as you are, um, yeah, everyone thinks, yeah, you're you're making all the decisions and things like this. Uh, but you, of course, you, you still have, you know, key stakeholders or people mm. that you, yeah, you either report to or are responsible for. Um, uh, just, just tell me a little bit about, you know, kind of key stakeholder management. Uh, I mean, it, 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 even at various levels, actually, yeah. through your career. Um, you know, key stakeholder management, you, you mentioned it actually earlier, um, becomes more and more important. And uh, from from my point of view, this was something I learned quite late, you know, and I, I actually it, it, it definitely hindered my career mm, progression, yeah. I, I would say, by not having an understanding. Uh, I mean, m- maybe you can give us your your insights in, in into that, uh, yeah. that aspect. Yeah, I mean, co- communication is everything, isn't yeah. it? So, and I think um, having an awareness of um, of your communication. So, what you say, what you do, how you've turned up to the office, yeah. what you're wearing, what you're wearing compared to what you normally wear, what um, what your facial expressions are like when you're walking around the building, um, and I think the, the further you go up the ladder. The more people watch you, so I think you know what you have to understand is that you are on stage all the time. Everybody is watching everything you are doing all of the time, um, and I think that for all of your stakeholders, so it's your team, your customers, um, your colleagues, your fellow directors, everybody is sort of looking to understand um, what whatever it is that you're doing means for them. Yeah, um, and so when you're um, talking with clients, you know, we've had a lot of problems and in, uh, problems with supply chain in our industry recently with um, uh, component parts and microchips, and it is just been unbelievable. And so, trying to manage the communication for that when everything is a moving part at all times, um, you know, we have upset clients. Yeah. Um, not from want of trying, but from just overload of information your customer, and right? data yeah. yeah 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 absolutely and so you've got to so if you're not speaking to your customers somebody else is and if you're not speaking to them they are making up what they think is going on with you so it's trying to get that balance right of of what that should look like and almost that sitting down with each one of your stakeholders whether it is a, a team member um, whether it is a department manager um, a client um, the bank whoever it is your um, is important to your business mm. work what's the rhythm that should the sh- that covers the communication is that a once a year meeting is that a weekly meeting is that a daily call is that a weekly update and how does that ebb and flow and change as the projects that they are working on become higher and lower priority and you've got to walk the line between being an annoying um, with too much information and yeah. communication um, and uh, 
and not um, and being absent when actually something's really important on their side of the fence um, where they need daily updates. So if you can, with a client, for example, um, if you can provide them the information that they are going to need before they've asked for it, um, and then their manager walks into their office and goes, what's going on with this? And they can tell them, then all of a sudden you've earned yourself a brownie point that you didn't even know you'd earned. And it's the same with the, the shop floor team, the same with the leadership team. Um, it's trying to make sure that that balance of communication and what they need to know and when they need to know it is uh, on a rhythm that is consistent. Yeah, yeah, okay. I, I think it's really interesting that uh, you say, you talk about key stakeholders, not only, you know, above or level, but also um, your, uh, yeah, your support team and, uh, yeah, like you say, even your, your, your customers and, and suppliers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, uh, it takes a, it's a huge team effort from top to bottom and everybody's yeah. got a part to play. Yeah. So. And and you mentioned um, that um, yeah the higher you you are then yeah obviously you kind of more exposed people are watching you more closely as you as you mentioned I, I, you know that's a lot of pressure it's a lot of responsibility um, how, how do you how do you cope do do, do you feel the pressure. Um. I think, yeah, I think once you, you know, you know, once you run a business, you you think about it all the time. It's the first thing you think about in the morning and the last thing you think about before you go to bed at night. And your brain works on things, problems and issues of how you're going to cope with tomorrow's challenges um, all the time. Um, But I think if you've... If you've got a passion for what it is that you're doing and you've got a job that you love and enjoy then you're probably in the 1% of people that are a little bit weird um, in the nicest possible way. (laughs) And you kind of, you you have to kind of be okay with that. That's your tribe. It's not, you know, there are those of us um, who, given a free Saturday morning of no other commitments, would choose to do our jobs. Yeah. There um, There are people out there that, you know, Oh, that's just who we are and how we're how we're built and what yeah. we love to do and that yeah. is our passion and some of us are fortunate enough to be in a situation yeah. where we can we can really you know um, work in a business where we can choose and yeah how we do that so yeah um so i think in not everybody's like that we have to accept that most of the people around us aren't like us and so again going back to being the only one in the room that's like you but that's okay and you need to find your tribe yeah and this is probably part of what you're doing here is yeah. building a tribe of people that mm. aren't built like everybody else who do want to do something different um and so that you have to be okay with with that um but you also like any overachiever you have to manage your health. One of the reasons that a lot of sports people have a coach is to stop them from overtraining. Yeah. And so you have to manage your health. You have to do the basics, yes. get enough sleep, yeah. eat well, look after your um, exercise routine, you know, all the basics, yeah. everything we already know. Yeah. But you have to you have to do those things because yeah. everything else will fall apart if you lose your health. You have got nothing. So. Yeah, we'll, we'll come back to this later. Mm-hmm. Um uh, in uh, kind of uh, the next part of the conversation. Okay, so tell me, let, let's talk a little bit about uh, hiring and recruiting. Um, as uh, well, as we were just uh, discussing earlier, um, this is a, a real, uh, I'd say passion almost for, of mine, uh, and mainly because of the importance um, that I certainly I place on it. So I'm, I'm, I'm very interested to understand what is your approach to, to hiring and, uh, and you know, finding people and, yeah, nurturing them. But, yeah, m- mainly the front end, you know, what, what is your yes. thoughts on that? So I think um, it starts with the culture of the business. Mm. So if you've built um, uh, a business whereby people want to work there, and I think that has to be the foundation of your your hiring strategy. So if you've got good people who and good managers who promote um, individuals and help them achieve their potential, 
all of those sort of bits and pieces are essentially the foundation. And then you work on um, your reputation. Because what you want to do is find yourself in a situation where people want to come and work for your business. And that's hard when you've got a small business. So you've got to build a reputation in your community or your industry as someone who is a great employer for all of the the reasons that, um, that, that scream out to most individuals. So the security staff, the taking care of people, the, the compassion for their personal situations, all of those things. So if you can start to generate a reputation for that, then you'll start to find that the recruitment will become a little bit easier. Then when you're onto the mechanics of the recruitment side, um, it's a... If you can involve your team, so it's um, social media, um, utilising your network, getting people that work for you to recommend you, getting clients to recommend you, suppliers to recommend you, building that reputation. And then there's going out and, to a certain extent, Building your, rep- building your relationship with you know, maybe a recruiter, but also being able to um, do the work, the legwork yourself. So getting on um, LinkedIn and finding the people that are right for your business yeah. um, and building that, um, that reputation, that, that, um, that network so that you've got you know, future team members. Um, and if you can build yourself a subs bench in each area of the business of people that you admire in the industry who you'd want to be part of your team as and when um, opportunities open up, then that's mm. quite a, a powerful place to, to be yeah. in terms of being able to make the right decisions in the business that you've got without feeling vulnerable yeah. that you're having to maybe hang on to someone for maybe longer yeah. than you like if they're causing damage within the business. Yeah. I, I always say, um, have this approach of um, not just hiring when you need someone because um, when, when, when you're... I mean, inevitably, it will, that will happen, of course. Mm. But when you when you need to hire under pressure, you're like, oh, we, we need to get that in because we might have a project or a contract coming in. Yes. And and the pressure to bring that person, that headcount in, can cert- sometimes override the, or, or shortcut the process. Yes. You know, yeah. and 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 of course, the the effects of that. Mm. Um, can be far more damaging than maybe delaying a project or or maybe yeah. even losing the project. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Have you have you? Yeah. Had so we've that? had um, we have a uh, I have a little bit of a saying, and I don't know whether this is appropriate, but um, better a hole than an asshole. Yeah. Is the is <laughs> yeah. the theme really? Yeah. So because you don't want to damage or upset the team that you've got by bringing in the, the wrong person, and it happens. It's difficult to make a decision on somebody. Very. In a in a couple of hours, you know, in a couple of interviews, it's not it's not easy to to know. Um, no. So when we we um, go through our um, interview process, we like to start with just a super casual, just a coffee, have a chat understand you know um, a little bit about that person nothing formal just to try and get them to sort of um, talk about who they are what's important for them what would be a win for them what they're looking for what are their career aspirations and get them to get a chance to know us as individuals and a bit as a business as well so do we think that you know do they like us do we like them um, sure and then move into a more sort of formal interview process um, with a, you know, more formal questions, that sort of side of stuff. And then, you know, considering the other tools that you have available to you, you know, psychometric mm. tests and things like that, trying to find a, a good one of those. So you do that, do you? We, we've done um, a few in the past. I, The ones we've done, it's interesting. Yeah. Because they don't, you know, we've done them for team members that we've got here. Um, so ex- existing, yeah, yeah, existing stuff to just yeah. kind of get a feel for what they might come out like, and yeah. it's not always didn't always agree with some of it. So either they're hiding it from me incredibly <laughs> well, yeah. or they've just felt pressure in terms of you know what questions, how they should answer questions. So I think, like with anything, you've you've got to to a certain extent use your your gut feel for a person, but. Get yourself as much opportunity as, yep. as you can. Yep. We also try to involve lots of different people in the interview process. So whether there's a tour yep. going around, somebody different does that, so that we can get a bit of an opportunity to 
to understand um, what that person's like, how they treat the pe- person that answers the door, yeah. right through to you know what they're like when they go round and what they're like in the interview. So getting that whole sort of 360 experience of, of trying to understand that person. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I try to, uh, again, I know it's difficult time-wise, but just, yeah, have as, as many touch points with, with that person in different scenarios, like mm. you're very casual, mm. obviously there's formal, yeah, like you say, tours or, or whatever. Mm. Um, and then uh, an, an, another thing that uh, we do is also... Yeah, just to try to get them to produce something. Obviously, related to if they're doing sales or they're doing like the website. Yeah, just some uh, a way to obviously check the technical or the the, the thought process, yeah. and then um, and then get them to present to, to talk about it if that's important. Obviously, yes. you know, yeah. for for that role, yeah. um, because yeah, that's a good way to find the bullshitters yes. from the real, yes. um, and then also. Uh, to find out how the thought pro, because we try to make it quite open ended, mm. right? So yeah. you could, and then it, it's if you do that, you can really find out the people that are taking it seriously. Yes. And by just yeah. the amount of effort, yes. you know, everyone gets obviously the same yeah. amount of time if it's multiple, ca- you know, candidates or, or not. Um, so that that's a really good way, so you, mm. and you can do that fairly yeah. fairly quickly, and and. And then obviously the communication side, if that's important for a role, which is pretty much, yeah. I would say, for, for all roles anyway, it's important to be able to communicate and obviously do that with, yes. you know, how, in, yeah. in various ways. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. So, um, you know, I, I, inev- inevitably, um, there's always going to be a situation where, for whatever reason, that person you certainly might think is is not going to work it's not working mm. out mm. um just tell me a little bit how, how do you deal how do you deal with that uh, at what point do you well what's your approach what's your thinking um but p- particularly at you know the ho- more higher levels you know yes. i would say managers or above yeah. um how long do you give them what's your process do you do uh, you know yeah, it's a, it's a it's a challenging one because often um, if it's uh, just a performance sort of based issue, so they're not doing something they should be doing, that's super easy to sort of tackle. The difficult ones are when it's a behavioural yeah. um, issue, so the way that they are either treating other people or um, yeah. Uh, but treating their own team, those kind of things are, are much more of a challenge. So what we've done, we've moved to a, a um, we've got us like a, a scorecard. Sounds worse than it is, but essentially <laughs> in terms of the role that anybody um, uh, has got here. So it will have all the, the normal stuff that you'd expect on a, a job description around um, what you'll be expected to do and deliver and all yeah. those sort of things. But then all of the, the soft skills as to the way that we do things here, the values, um, those kind of items. And so um, everybody has a, an opportunity to score themselves on all of those items. And the idea is that that helps us to understand where they feel um, like they're weaker in some areas and others so that we can give them the correct support and training. So if they feel like you know having difficult conversations is something they really um, struggle with, then we'll put together some training to help them you know, have those kind of conversations so that they can feel like it doesn't have to be done in an awful way, but they don't feel quite so overwhelmed by doing it or worse, just avoid doing it altogether. So we have this scorecard so that they can have, um, they can mark themselves in terms of where we are. But it's also where it's got the soft skills on it as well. Um, if they aren't displaying those, it's a nice framework to sit down with the person and say, look, you know, you've marked yourself on professionalism mm. um, as a you know, 10 out of 10, yeah. but this particular behaviour doesn't seem to demonstrate that. Yeah. Do we need to sort of look at that? And it makes having that kind of conversation a lot easier. So it's um, so the first part of that is, you know, we're super clear about what is expected, what behaviours, the way that we do things, um, what is required. And then there's a, a mechanism to have that conversation with those people if they're not quite um, 
coming up to the the standard that we would expect and the behaviours that we would expect within the business. And then, you know, if you have that conversation a few times, then it starts to become a, a more structured, more um, formal conversation. But I think, you know, nine times out of ten, if you can catch it early enough then um, you're in the right place. I think the other key thing with it is you can have people that have been brilliant working in the business and all of a sudden they've gone off the boil or start not behaving the way that they did before. And that comes down to the um, leadership and the management skills because you need to understand with that person what's going on with them. So ignoring that behavior is the worst thing that you can do. Sitting down or maybe taking that person off site and have a coffee because it might be something that the business has done and intentionally or unintentionally, you know, it's quite often that, you know, as we've already talked about, sometimes what we say and what actually happens and what people hear are, um, are misaligned. So it might be the case of, you know, just correcting a behaviour or communication that they feel um, offended by or um, hard done by about is, is all that's needed. But equally, it could be something that's going on with them personally. In which case, you know, the manager's job yep. is to sort of not get all the information, but to understand that situation and put some stuff in place to help them manage themselves through that time um, and they get the rest of the team to sort of take a bit more of the strain so that they can focus on the most important areas of their life, which is, you know, is always going to be f- um, family and personal life. Um, yep. And then once they're ready to, you know, come back, build back the the work again and I think if you can be there for people when they need you the most then what you have at the end of that is um, someone who will work for you um, to the full of their ability yes yeah building up that uh, loyalty and Mm. it's a two way Mm. thing of course Mm. yeah absolutely but you're you know in in leadership you you know you know you're judged on the the behaviour that you tolerate so if you yeah um, allow any bad behavior or you don't jump onto something quick yeah. enough then it will manifest and, and become worse so you really do have to be brave you have to have those conversations and you have to have them quickly and if you have someone in the business who is not demonstrating any of the values that you expect yeah. then you've got to get rid of them quickly yeah 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 so. yeah okay now that makes complete sense so, uh, what are you, I mean, as a leader, uh, MD, what is what would you say are your your core values? There are us as a business, um, respect. So, treating others with respect um, and being respectful of other people's situations. Mm. Um, learning, everyone um, having an opportunity to learn, and also being kind if someone doesn't get it right first time. Yeah. So, um, and you know, sharing that knowledge of you know. Um, we've done it like this, similar to the podcast you're doing here. You know, it's mm. you know if someone's learned something, sharing that knowledge and not just keeping it to yourself. Um, empathy, so making sure that you're sort of considering that the, the reaction you're getting, if it doesn't feel right, maybe it's something a bit more than that. That next step thinking, being a bit yeah. wiser of, of what it is that you're doing. Yeah. Um, working together as a team, um, not just sort of internally, but with our customers as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's yeah. Well, trust is a big one, so yeah. we've got to be able to build trust uh, with each other. And I think that some of these also, you know, they've got to spill out into the supply chain um, and to the customer base as well. Yeah. So and and uh, you know, obviously, you know, these are all uh, your company values. I mean, what what about personally? How how would you? Um, describe you know your your core values or how you wish to be perceived right as oh, okay. as a as oh, a leader yes good question <laughs> good question um so, that is a good question um i would hope that the the team would respect me for being fair um and open and i try to um understand you know what's going on before reacting so it's important that um, we're a small business it's important my team feel that they can come and talk to me about what's happening and not hide things from me because they're scared of my reaction yeah so i'd like to think that they consider me to be firm but fair um, and also that i'll challenge them yeah so um yeah one of my sort of i feel very fortunate to be in the position that i'm in 
um, and have this opportunity to run a business. You know, I mean, as a as a woman, you know, there's parts of the world where you know women aren't allowed to drive. Yeah. So you know, to to have this opportunity, um, I feel very very fortunate, and so. If I can help the the team members that I have achieve their potential as well, yeah, then I've done my job. So on that as well. So uh, yeah, as a female leader um, today, um, you know, obviously there's you know a, a lot of advancements, you know, for women's opportunities and, and everything else. But of course, yeah, still not there, yet, right? Mm, yeah. Um, what do you find e- even today? you know, recently um, as um, challenges, you know, of, of being a female leader. Do, do you yeah. still have any, 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 anything, any challenges? Yeah, I suppose, What's yeah. Um, I think one of the challenges that I think has been sort of talked about more and more sort of frequently, I think, is the menopause. Mm. Oh, I'm not, I'm yeah. not, yeah, I'm not there, not quite there <laughs> yet, but I can sort of, there are days where I kind of, I just want to kill everyone. Mm. Um, and I, <laughs> I have those days, I, but yeah. <laughs> and I can't. Um, I, uh, yeah, I, where my patience isn't sometimes what it once was, um, and so I recognise that you know that for women is a is a challenge, and I think it's something that's being being spoke about more it and is. more now. I think you know we have to be in a call. Uh, for yes. that to, 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 you know, she's done a huge amount of Gabby work, Logan as well has yeah. talked about it a lot. Yeah, yeah. So, and I think that as a as a challenge, um, you know, for women, um, perhaps you know, my age now, sort of, you know, and, and moving forward, mm. um, you know, lots of women give up their jobs. Uh, is one of the statistics um, because of the, the challenges of dealing with menopause. Yeah. Um, and I just can't do that. I've got 60 mortgages that are people relying on me. So I cannot afford to yeah. not deal with this. So I think that that will be one of the challenges, not just mm. for me, but sort of many women in any kind of um, job or industry. So we've got to, so I think it's really important that we have those conversations um, and, the, yeah. you know, we support each other and understand how business can support women who are, you know, massively successful and hugely contributing to, to industry all over the world. Um, but we need to support them if they're going through those challenges. Yeah, um, yeah. And that is, it's been a secret and something that everybody hides and it's yeah. got to change, I think. Yeah, no, I respect a lot that you, that, that's, bit, that's your answer. And... Um, yeah, the only way is to talk about it, and so I, th- mm. I think it's it's great that mm. that to you you bring that up. Um, you know, obviously, um, going through your your journey, um, and to obviously to you know to where you are today, um, you're gonna have to make sacrifices, of course. Yes, you'll do. Yes. Can you just talk to me about that? You, you know, what do you think? You know, of course, there's all of the good, right, yes. that you're doing. You love what you do. Yep. Um, you're passionate. But it comes at a cost, right? It does. You know, what What would you say were the biggest sacrifices that you've had to make? So um, I think that you have to be comfortable being on your own. So one of the mm. things that I learned fairly early on, actually, was um, if you step away from the herd, the herd will turn on you. And what I mean by that is that if you decide you're going to do something different to what everybody else is doing, particularly when you're younger, then Mm. they will not necessarily appreciate it. Because most people think about being right and wrong. um, And if you're doing something different to what they're doing, then their perception is that you think that they are wrong. Yeah. And so they would prefer for you to do what they are doing rather than what you are doing because it's easier for them. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Um, and I think there's a... I've heard a story about crabs. So there's like a... And lobster pots and how they work. Do you know anything about... No, right, I, okay. I like eating. I will, I will tell, I'll me. tell you the story and yeah. you can cut it out if you choose to. <laughs> so um, lobsters go along the sea, see food in a lobster pot, 
get in the lobster pot, eat the food. Oh, food, that's really great. So more yep. lobsters kind of come in. Um, as in lobster jump, pot, as in as in the sea, as in the sea, as in as a trap. Yeah, so not, all of these lobsters kind of yeah. jump into this lobster pot. Yeah. Um, and then eventually they've eaten all the food, but they don't know that. So more lobsters kind of come into the lobster pot. Um, to the point where, you know, they're all so one will go, there's no food in here, I'm going to get out. And so it will try to climb out of the lobster pot, but the others are like, no, don't go, and they will pull it back in. And if it tries oh. to cut it, if it keeps trying to cut it, they will kill it for trying to get out of the lobster pot. And I think you've, so, and it's a little <laughs> bit like that. If you want to do something different, then you have to expect that you're going to be on your own. Yeah. And I think one of the things, one of the sacrifices is probably all of my friends have another best friend. So I've got my, I've got my sister who I would consider to be my best friend now, yeah. but so certainly through when I was younger, all of my friends had other friends. I had lots of friends, but no friends that were sort of, um, mm. uh, like a best friend, if you know what I mean. Sure, yeah. More so, perhaps more so now where I've got to know women that are doing things that are similar to what I'm doing. But for a long time, um, mm. yeah, I didn't really have sort of yeah. friends that I could relate to like that. I think the other challenge has been sometimes in relationships, if you're successful as a woman, that doesn't necessarily work very well in a relationship particularly if you are maybe doing more than your partner, and that can be very challenging. Mm -hmm. I think the time that it takes up, I know lots of women do have um, families and children and juggle uh, jobs. I haven't been able to, to do both. Yeah. I just, I, I, I find it, I found it too difficult to, to run a business and have children as well. So, mm -hmm. um, but I'm not, you know, you don't get everything, right? No, nobody gets everything, no. so you have to make a choice as to yeah. what you want to do. And actually, you know, it's it's also it's okay not to have children. And I yeah. think there's a pressure on women to, to yeah. do that. Yeah. And that's not for everybody. Yeah. So that's been my choice. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, I mean, even if you say, okay, yeah, I, I make th I make this compromise or this sacrifice. Uh, and that's the decision. It, it doesn't mean that you still get that anyway, right? No. Because no. life or yeah. um, chance or fate, whatever you want yeah. to call it, will will give you whatever it is that you're going to get yeah. anyway, right? Absolutely. So, Absolutely. you know, you, you can't control everything. No. You know no. what I mean? No. Yeah. You just, you, you've just got to do your best and hope for the best and just keep moving forward. Yeah. You just pick yourself up, get back on the horse. Yeah. Have another go. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, this, what is it they say? Winners never quit and quitters never win. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah you just got to, you know, that's that early education of being on your own, getting back on the horse, that tenacity just to keep having another go, having another go. Mm. And I think that probably the last three years in industry, what with COVID and the supply chain and the war in Ukraine, mm. everything else that's happened, what business leaders have built up is a level of tenacity mm. that, you know we could do with a break now yeah you know, it would be nice to have a little bit of respite for a period of time but yeah. we we have that resilience and, and that tenacity mm. and so you know um i really hope that anyone who's um, and i have friends whose businesses have sort of failed more recently because of the challenges um i hope that anybody that's in that boat doesn't take it personally at this time because mm. i think that what's been thrown at us and what we've had to deal with over the last particularly three years mm. is over and above what anybody should have to, to deal with. Yeah, yeah. So... Yeah, it's tough times. And uh, do, do you get, you know, do, I, I, you know, the feeling of being alone, you know, and um, ha, have, you, have you felt that at times? Or you, do you have a, a yeah. good network, you know, support? Yeah. Yeah, um, I think, you know, trying to get around people that can experience what you're experiencing. Yeah. And I think that's why the work that you're doing with these um, videos is really important because it helps people not feel alone. Yeah. So joining organisations um, like Make UK, things yep. like that, you know, <laughs> to try and be in an environment where you're speaking to people that are going through what you are going through. Um, and, you know meeting up with other managing directors, finding yourself a, a peer group of people that you can sit down with and trust and just talk to and just say, do you know what? I don't know what to do. I've got no idea what I'm going to do about this. And, you know, just having it to talk through with people because when you're in an office environment or the work environment, you can't easily or don't feel like you can just turn around to people and go, 
I don't know what to do. Yeah. What do you think we should do? Yeah. And then, you know, everyone starts panicking. <laughs> you can't have that. So <laughs> it's trying to sort of, yeah, build that team up so that you've got, you know, within the business a, a, a management team that you can lean on, rely on, and, you know, to a certain extent have those conversations with. But yeah. Having an a, a external peer group, whether that's an industry one or group of MDs that you talk to or um, a friend's network, um, and, you know, a good family, yeah. you know, if you're lucky to be blessed with that. Yeah. So, you know, making sure that you see them, make time for them, and they, they are the ones that will notice if you're um, running yourself down or it's getting too much, um, yeah. and they were the ones that you need to rely on to sort of say, Look, come on, you need to take a few days. Yeah. So it's having that, that whole support network. So uh, we met the king. Yes, we did, <laughs> yes. Um, both <laughs> you and I. Um, t- tell me, because I've got my story, but this is obviously about you. But uh, tell, tell me about how you found out. And then obviously the, the, the day or the evening, yes. or the day leading up to it and the evening itself. Just yeah, yes. talk about um, it. So uh, I didn't know anything about it until um, we, I got this envelope that had arrived. And um, I was rushing around the office like you do, and I picked it up. Um, I don't know if I should say this or not, but I was going to the loo, and I thought, oh, I'll just have a look because it's kind of yeah. So I took it with me because you've got no time as a leader of a business to just go to the loo and not, no. you know, not do some work at the same. <laughs> you got a multitask. So yeah, when so, you're, uh, yeah. so I take it in there and I looked at it, and I was like, I can't open this in here. <laughs> I shouldn't, I shouldn't even have brought it in here at all, to be fair. So I was like, no, okay, no, so. Um, so I came back upstairs, got my stuff together because I, had, um, I was actually going to the funeral of one of the team, that, wife of one of the team that work here. Got my stuff in the bag, went to the funeral, left it in the... Um, so I didn't open it because I thought, this looks like something I should open properly with a yeah. knife kind of thing and <laughs> yeah. keep it all. So um, uh, then went around to see my sister after after the funeral. Um and um, we opened it and was like, is this a real thing? Is this <laughs> actually yeah. sort of happening? And yeah. is it, how is this, how? Yeah. How does something <laughs> yeah. like this yeah, happen? Um, so I was like, oh, okay. Well, it's, it's, I'm guessing it, well, it looks real. So, um, right, let's go shopping. <laughs> <laughs> Any excuse. <laughs> so, yeah, so the so uh, we got jumped in the car um I just went into to Guildford and yeah, went and trying to trying to find a dress in November that's suitable to wear into a palace. What do you wear to a palace? You know, what, is there a protocol? Did you Google for it? This? <laughs> yeah, we did. Just, are you allowed to have? You know, what is the, what's the appropriate sort yeah. of attire? What do they mean? But I think it was day dress, wasn't it? Yeah, what's the protocol for? Yeah, yeah. what does, what that, does mean? that mean? Yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah. So after we'd done the shopping and sort of calmed down and sort of you know <laughs> tried to make sure that we knew it was real, then yes, um, uh, I think it turned out. Ha- having mentioned it to a few people, it turned out that Make UK had nominated, um, well, I think it was, the f- it was the f- three of us, was there? Yeah, I think so, yeah. 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 So, um, yeah. which was, you know, a, h- a huge um, deal. Yeah. Um, and a huge honour to of, of all the, the members that they've got, you know, I, I, you know I'm it's amazed unbelievable. to this day yeah. that, you know, I even made the list. So, I know. Um, given all the amazing businesses that they they work with so yeah that was yeah huge huge surprise um and i remember you know so roll forward to the day got Mm. dropped off outside um and sort of queuing to sort of going in it's like we're going in through the front i know it's it's just the front i know let's just turn up to the front (laughs) of buckingham palace so yeah and then starting to let (laughs) us in and we're now walking through the front courtyard under the balcony where they you know where the you know all the photo calls i'm like we're actually actually here yeah. So, um, yeah, walking and, and through there and sort of into the insides. And I was like, you know, what's, what can we, what can I take? <laughs> well, there must be something that I can sort of, you know, and, but they've got that, you know. They, yeah, everything's everything. nailed down. So I'm like, OK, well, I'm going to get, you know, I'll go in, so I'll, get a, I'll get some loo roll. <laughs> it's just normal loo roll. I was so disappointed. So, but no, I ended up coming back with a paper towel and some gravel from the drive. <laughs> some gravel. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, no, and but you you sort of get in there, and that's where we 
sort of met. So we we're trying yeah. to, you know, I think there was one point where um, we're sort of trying to work out because we're in this long, thin room. Right? Yeah, and it's huge. Doors at, doors at each end, and you kind of think, well, perhaps he's gonna he's gonna come in one I end know. and go out the other. So we thought, oh, well, hedge our bets. We're sort of near the middle. So he's come in the end that we're in. So we're like, oh, right, brilliant. Okay, so we stand a chance. So. So we're shuffling the backwards and forwards in the room to try and get in the right line for where he is. He's yeah. going to come along. And then start, people starting to notice the time. And he's only got like 25 away of the percent through the room. And we've only got sort of, I don't know, yeah. half an hour less. So all of a sudden, everyone from the other end is coming yeah. all the way down the room to, to sort of our bit. And it's starting to get very tight. And uh, um, uh, the, uh, the other lady that we were there with... We are all sort of huddled in like this. And all of a sudden she went, oh, look at such and such and hit the bottom of my drink. And I poured no. a whole glass of champagne over my, my new dress. Oh, my god! Like, oh, that's kind of awkward. <laughs> so now I'm standing like this. <laughs> it's such an honour to be here. <laughs> just trying to sort of make it seem like that was, you know, that was just how, oh, how I would stand like that. Yeah. So I think when, <laughs> So when I did eventually sort of get to, to speak to her, to take hands of Keen, I was sort of behind someone else with my arm through so he couldn't see the fact that I was covered in my drink. So, but yes, other than that, yeah. it was, uh, yeah, it went swimmingly. Like, we got a chance to talk to Prince Edward, mm. who was lovely. Um, had a bit of a chance to sort of um, to, to speak to him. Um, and oh, yeah, right. just the yeah. whole experience was... Sort of, but they they are so organised in terms of what they were sort of doing. And, yeah, yeah. Um, it was yeah quite an experience to sort yeah, of go and do that. Yeah. So, but yeah, a huge huge honour and something that I had never expected. And no. I think that is you know that's as particularly as a small business that's the benefit of getting involved with membership organisations, yeah. isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Completely. Yeah. Recommend it. One hundred percent. Obviously, mm. because of. Uh, of that one yeah. in a lifetime yeah. experience, yeah. yeah, it was great. Yeah. It's phenomenal. Mm. Um, maybe I'll do a video on that one day. Yes, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know. Actually, maybe not. Um, okay, so um, slightly more um, serious note, actually. Yes. Um, mental health, um, mm. you know, big again discussion uh, now a lot more open. Certainly, more, yes. you know, even five years ago, yes. certainly ten years ago. Yeah. Um, have Have you ever suffered from, you know, the, certainly you know symptoms associated, um, you know, a, 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 any period of times or any specific events, you know, yeah. obviously, you know, having to be in this position yeah. that, that, you, yeah. that you hold. So, um, yeah, for a long time, actually. So um, I went through being bullied at school. Oh, really? Mm. Mm. Um, but which again, which was, again, I'd put down to training for learning to be on your own. Yeah. So it all falls into place eventually, yeah. these things, yeah. doesn't it? Exactly, so, yeah. um, and I think off the back of that, I developed an eating disorder. So for 20 years, I'd sort of battled this eating disorder until a point where things in my personal life had got even worse and it got to the point where you know I need to deal with this and sort it out so spent some time um, with a great support of um, you know a, a local eating disorder service because an eating disorder is not about the eating disorder it's about how you feel about yourself so going back to yeah. the imposter syndrome thing it's a yeah. symptom of you know, like like alcoholism and yeah. drugs and um, eating disorders are all just a symptom of what's really going on in your mind yes and so the manifestation yeah, of that right yeah but you know i didn't know that's what no that's what it was of course no. so but then you know there is great help out there for for mm. people but you know it's it's not easy to to go through that and uh, you know in terms of those those challenges to to work through those processes but i think what it's done is it's taught me that you know actually if you do do that you and you face those demons mm. because it's easier to go down a bottle or you know, distract yourself with what you did or didn't eat yesterday. Yeah. Um, if you do that work, it gives you a skill set that you can't buy. Mm. And actually, to to embrace that and do, um, yeah, as I say, do that work, um, hugely valuable in terms of recognizing it in others as well. Yeah. So I think that. Because um, because of that, 
when we went through the COVID experience, what we could sort of see with what was going on with the team members, or some of the team members, most of them actually, was part of how we had to look after them during the COVID mm. phase, because people were struggling. You know, yeah. They were in relationships that you wouldn't necessarily want to be locked down with no. those people. And yeah. I think lots of people, things that were just kind of yeah. bubbling along in the background for yeah. a long time that yeah. people were ignoring. People just cope, right? And, yeah. you know, day to day. Yeah, absolutely. Living. And they, they came to a head during yeah. COVID. Um, and I think, it, you know, in terms of the mental health, I don't think we have even the smallest grasp of the price we've paid for what we've done. So to give you an example, I'm aware of, you know, two people that passed away with COVID. Um, mm. One of which was, you know, a, a really uh, old guy who, you know, yeah, was lovely, but, you know, um, in reality wasn't long for this world, shall we say. Um, but I'm aware of six or seven guys in their 30s to 50s that committed suicide during that time. So the price we've paid for what we've done and the fact that we don't probably even have the smallest understanding of the challenges around mental health that uh, exist yeah. out there yeah. and what people are hiding is is massive. Yeah, so we, you think, yeah, the, the, we're still really early, you know, even though yeah. we're talking yeah. about it more. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think it's I think it's yeah. great that that conversation is um, on the radar. Um, I think it's great that there are charities around that sort of support this stuff, but the the support is not not anywhere near enough for the number of people that need it. And mm. I think that is a challenge for the government in terms of how they are going to deliver the services that are going to be needed. What, um, why is it? Why do you think this is happening? Why is this so? So many. I think there's yeah. I think instances. there's a lot of yeah. I think there's a lot of challenges. I think the pressure on everybody to do and achieve more and yeah. Um, I think you know, particular younger generation um, with social media. Yeah. Um, the perception of what is displayed for everybody yeah. else yeah. as being normal, when actually the reality is quite yeah. different. I think can be quite damaging if you've not got a strong um, personality. Um, well, that's, so that's that's not right. I've, I take that back. Can you scratch that out? Because it's got nothing to do with that. I think if you, you know, if everybody at all times feels imposter syndrome or vulnerable, and yeah. I think it can be a very lonely place if you've got just the general issues of life that kind of come up and then compounded by some of the pressures that are, uh, are put on everybody these days of how you look, what you've got, what you've achieved, who you are. How many friends you've got? Yeah, yeah. How many likes you have? I call them like fake matrix. You know, you know the, the metrics that yeah. the metrics, not matrix. Mm. Um, yeah, that are deemed as um, you know that determine you know your success or, or how you're perceived. You know, of course, and um, yeah, these these so-called values are. You know, are now coming more, mm. more prevalent, and I, and I think yeah, that's cool. That's that's creating a new kind of wave yeah. of 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 these problems. You know, yeah. so yeah, I think it's you know, I, I think it's a real challenge to be a young person these days. Yeah, I think the pressure is is too much. Yeah, yeah, it's tough. Mm. It's tough. Um, are you successful? Would you, how would you, how do you describe success? Would I, how would I describe success? Yeah. So, um, I have a successful marriage. Yes. So I would well say done. yes. I'm successful <laughs> Congratulations. There. Yes. He's, you know, he's uh, continuing to put up with me. How many years? Do you don't mind me asking? Um, seven. Yeah. Okay. Seven years. Or so, um, yeah, I feel very fortunate to have, have mm. met my perfect husband who tolerates all of my <laughs> weirdness um, yeah. and passion for my job. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I think that requires some tolerance. Um, I have a successful family. I'm very lucky to um, have a yeah. wonderful mum and dad and supportive yeah, sounds um, like family. Um, successful friends. So I've got a. Now I've got a you know and a very um, wonderful friendship group, which is great. Um, successful business, uh, I'd say that um, there's always more that you can do, and I think if you are built the way that we built, whatever we've done is never enough. There's always more that you want to do mm -hmm. and want to achieve, and you lose sight of sort of where you are. And I think the general stress and worry makes it difficult to um, look at it as being successful. 
but yeah. we're, you know, we're still in the game. And mm. that's, you know, that's got to be a win. The these, that's got to be a win these days. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Um, could I do more? Uh, am I where I want to be? Probably not. <laughs> so, would that be a success? No, I think it's still on the journey. Yeah. So, so you know, look, uh, apart from just, you know, being that 1%, right? Yeah, you know, whether that's a mindset or just, just the way you're made, right? You know. Um, then, then there's the nature nurture type type of um, debate, but um, you know what what is it about you? Because it, it, it's not just you know the the, the nature, right? You, you know you work hard, right? And you've achieved everything through hard work, through mm. whatever. So what what is it about you that has meant? Because there's, there can only be so many. You can only be one leader, like as you say, right? And uh, so, what is it about you that makes you different that has led to your success? Mm. You know, what, what what do you think are the the things specifically about you? About me? Yeah. Oh God, that's a difficult question. Um, <laughs> I think I'm quite tenacious. Yeah. I think I'm quite thick-skinned, really, mm-hmm. um, which is a good and bad thing from the not necessarily sort of taking on board too much of um, what's sort of said about me, um, but equally a bit of a problem in as much as um, don't n- maybe not got the empathy that I should have when people are trying to tell me something and I've missed the point. So um, what's, what is it about me that's got me here? Uh, that's really hard. <laughs> Um, people struggle with this question because you, you have to basically self-promote yourself. Yeah. So a lot of people find it hard. Yeah, I would say um, oh, hang on, just <laughs> one more. Yeah, okay. what is Take it? Yeah, um, what would? Yeah, what? Why? How is it as I've got here? What, what is it about? I think it's just I, yeah. I'm going to say being brave. Yeah. I think really, yeah. and um, being brave enough to have a go, even if you think you can't do it. Yeah, yeah. Because I don't think there's ever a point where I thought I could do. I could, you know, I I, I know everything because I don't, and I don't think anybody ever mm. will. Um, but to just be brave enough to have a go. Yeah. Just, just be brave. Yeah. I think that's it. So actually. That leads quite nicely into um, what I'll ask you next, which is about the, you know, comfort zone, you know, and certainly for for me, I always um, talk about this, uh, you know, outside the comfort zone uh, and the benefits of it. And I I think that's kind of what you're talking Mm. about. I mean, but, you know, give give me your thoughts on comfort zone and, how how that's benefited you yeah. and and you know for for anyone watching why you know why should they um take themselves outside the comfort zone and what do you think mm. the benefits for them yeah could be so i think it's it's yeah it's okay Sorry. okay yeah 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 no worries oh, well, I'll a little chance to think about that yeah one, yeah then. yeah so, so at uh, Intratech UK, we have a motto, um, who dares wins. Rodney. <laughs> Rodney, yes. Um, do you want me to do that again? Sorry, do you want me to say that? It's fine, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we have a motto, <laughs> who dares wins. Um, do, do you have a motto, per, like personally, not, not necessarily for your business, do, do you have something that you, that you say to yourself, well, you know, like, this is my yeah. thing that... Uh, yeah, sort of like personal mentor. Yeah, a little. Um, yeah, and I think it's, uh, it's um, yeah, it's to, do, to do all I can with all I've been given. Okay, I, think I, will, yeah. I, I will feel like I've achieved my potential if I do all I can with all I've been given. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, great. Um... So we have like a uh, closing question okay. uh, always, and it's quite simple. And w- it starts off as, uh, I wish someone had told me, da-da-da-da. 
So, uh, okay. how would you uh, okay. answer that? I wish someone had told me. I wish someone had told me that um, everyone else is only thinking about themselves. <laughs> Is that it? I think, That's yeah, it. that was, would be, yeah. yeah, one of the, yeah. Yeah. Because I think we spend so much time worrying about what <laughs> other people think about who we are and what we've said and what we're doing. In reality, they're only thinking about themselves. Yeah. And if I'd have known that, I'd have worried a whole lot less, mm. I think. Great so. advice. Fantastic. <laughs> All right. Okay, well... Thank you, Laura, for your time. I, I, I think um, I really enjoyed the conversation, actually. Uh, I, I really mean that from, from my heart. Um, I think very inspirational. I've learned a lot from you today. Really, I, I really mean that, actually. That and um, for insights into uh, lobsters' behaviour... <laughs> Um, and uh, also your, your honesty as well, actually. I, I, I think it's, it's great, and I really appreciate it. And uh, I've really enjoyed uh, spending a few hours with you and uh, talking to you. So thank you very much. I, I really appreciate it. It's my, my absolute pleasure, and um, yeah. Yeah, I, I hope that you know, the work's, great work that you and the team are doing benefit you know, our next generation yeah, of aspirational hopefully. leaders. Great. So. All right. Thank you very much. Five. <laughs> there you go, it's much better. <laughs>